This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're back to Think Tech Tech Talks on Think Tech. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Our show today is called October is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. It's more than meets the eye. We're going to talk about how we can be cyber secure in business and how businesses have to be proactive to prevent damage and loss of reputation and clientele resulting from cyber attacks. If you want to ask a question or make a comment about this discussion, you can tweet us at ThinkTechHI or call us live at 808-374-2014. Our guest for this show is Brian Fannin of Dietrich Insurance right here in Honolulu. So we have October. It's National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. It seems like, you know, every other week, another news story about how a business is being hacked uh, with related warnings to customer about the loss of their private information and compromise. There's, there's much more, you know, uh, intangible fallout beyond that for business and for business clientele. So in short, it's nearly impossible, and Brian can confirm this or deny it, uh, to fully insulate a business from cyber attacks, but businesses can take steps to make it more difficult for cyber attackers and to guard against those events. Welcome to the show, Brian Fannin of Dietrich Insurance. It's nice to see you here. Thank you very much. I appreciate the invite. Yeah. So, you know, every company now has to keep up with the technology because there are those out there who want to, who keep up with the latest ways to attack businesses. So businesses must defend themselves. And that's your job. How did you get such a job? Um, fascinated with security, actually. I love it. Yeah. Um, in many different at, uh, forms. So I started working, uh, doing implementations for actually a laser tag company back in the 90s. And then that kind of, merged into, you know, you had to install the technical equipment, um, and then it just kind of went from one to another and uh, started doing the IT manager role. And then, you know, once you do that, then you get a, a big introduction to people and the technology and what's coming at you and what you got to defend yourself against. Yeah. What fascinates you about this? There's just so much to it, and it changes so fast. Changes so fast. It just changes so fast. How is it changing now? It's changing now because I think as an industry, the security industry has done a really good job of, of hardening the companies. You know, if you do the, the baseline stuff, you know, we've, we've got firewalls in place, you've got firewalls on the computers, you've got antivirus. Um, as long as you do the stuff you're supposed to do, 90% of your problems aren't there. The things that have been changing more is that now the hackers are targeting the everyday users. And that's, the, that's how they're getting in. How do they do that? I mean, I, I'm not an insurance company. I'm just an ordinary schmo. How are they targeting me now? They're targeting you because they want you to do one of two things, and in the end, it's for the one thing. is They want to install malware on your computer that's mm -hmm. going to do what they want it to do. And they do that one of two ways. Either they have you follow a link that goes to a bad website, or they have you open an attachment that has the malware in it. So it's a deception. Um, it's, they're suckering me in some way or another. And if I'm smart, I can see that happening and, and not participate in being suckered. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so you get an email that looks like it's from Pizza Hut, you get a free pizza on every Monday, yeah. and all you got to do is follow the link to go to the website and download it. Yeah. Are you going to click the link? Yeah. I got one this morning. I mean, every day there's something really, and there's, you know, you got to have a, a high level of paranoia to deal with this. <laughs> and it said, uh, you know, you're a nonprofit. We have $28, $28, it's a very suspicious number, um, waiting for you. And all you have to do is click this link, and you'll have $28 contribution to your nonprofit. I said, I never heard of this company. I never heard of their domain name. Um, you know what I did? I didn't click the link. Was I right? So the key word you said there, yeah. the most important thing, yeah. you never heard of their domain name. Right. That's the, that's the key there. Because what they'll do is they'll try to craft some kind of sell, right? Some kind of thing that'll make you want to go there. And then if you follow the link without checking where it goes first, odds are pretty good something bad's going to happen. I mean, you know, if you're on the street and some guy says, hey, I got, I got some candy in this Let me panel show van you what over I here. Got, yeah. Come on in. You know, <laughs> you're not going to go in because you can see there's a panel van there. It looks suspicious. But most people don't know to check the link to see what actual domain they're going to. Yeah. And that, that actually has been the focus of what uh, 
people in, in our profession have been doing for the last couple of years is like training users, like understand what a domain name is and look at the link before you go there. Yeah. And if you can train people how to understand that, you're solving a huge amount of yeah. risk that you could have as an organization. Well, it's, um, it's, it's fooling you, it's social engineering you. Totally. Right? Um, and uh, seeing, if, well, seeing if you'll bite on some cute little $28, you know, bait, so to speak. Um, and, and I think we should all be very, but is there any other way? For example, Microsoft um, may or may not uh, have a patch on a given problem. And you, you have no control over that. In fact, you don't have that much control in figuring out when you should download that patch on your machine. Um, so uh, th that's not your fault. You, you, know, you, can't, you can't really protect against Microsoft's failure to patch against a particular risk, or can you? So there's, there's two pieces of that puzzle, right? So you mentioned that you can't really control when the, when the patches come down. So as a regular user, you know, you should just set your machine to download the patches when they ever come out and get installed. Automatically. Automatically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, kind of no question. So in organizations, we control those. So we, an organization typically will, will know when the patches are coming out because you'll get the, the notification. And then each company will have their own what they call a patching policy. So as an or, in an organization, you don't want to just put a patch on and then, oh, great, it broke our server and now nobody can get any work done. So when patches are released, then you have your patching policy that defines how soon you're going to apply those, if you're going to test them ahead of time. Testing and, sounds good. It, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to make sure stuff doesn't break. I mean, they're yeah. pretty good about not breaking stuff, but every once in a while something does get broken. Yeah. Um, so the thing, the downside, though, is, is the speed at which you do that is key because what happens is, is, is so it's, it's the first Tuesday of every month is when Microsoft releases these patches. But that's that's a true fact. It's the first Tuesday of every month. So... If you get it on a Thursday, then you should be worrying that maybe that's not a legitimate patch. Um, well, typically, if you download it directly from Microsoft, it's going to be a legit legitimate patch. Now, okay. if the hackers ever get a circumvent that, yeah, well, then wow. we're in trouble. But, we're all in trouble, yeah. But, um, so they call that Patch Tuesday. Okay. So what do, you, what do you think they call Wednesday? Patch Wednesday. Nope. Hack Wednesday. <laughs> Thank you. Because <laughs> what happens is, is Microsoft or even other organizations, when they announce a patch, they say, hey, we found this vulnerability. Um, hackers can get in this way and do these things. Well, not all the hacker community knows that. So on Tuesday, they're reading their, their news and they're like, oh, I didn't know I could do that. So they immediately start coding and writing programs that take advantage of that vulnerability. Uh -huh. So within a week, there's thousands of programs that have been written to take advantage of that vulnerability that was announced. Oh, wow. So <clears throat> if you don't download the patch, you're subject to those programs. Yeah, and the longer you wait, the more programs there are. Yeah. So, uh, so what you know, you mentioned phishing and you know deception and social engineering is 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 my great and controllable risk on my own machine or machines. Um, but insurance companies different. Uh, they have protocols and programs, and, and they they're regulated to have these things, right? What's it like being in Dietrich or any insurance company in terms of dealing with the possibility of being hacked? Hmm. Well, the good thing about the regulations and is that it's making you do the things you should be doing anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the baseline core things like having a firewall, having backups, checking to see what your vulnerabilities are from the outside world, checking to see what your vulnerabilities are from the inside world. So the, the regulatory body, you know, it can be a lot of work, but it's just making you do the things you should do in the first place. Which you would do anyway if you were Akamai about it, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but, but the other thing is that <clears throat> if you want to be an insurance company, like any company, even like any, any nonprofit, you have to be innovating, you have to be moving ahead, you have to be mm, improving your software, getting new software, addressing new sy system problems uh, all the time, all the time. So how, how can a guy in your position as a systems, uh, you know, technical, technical service manager, or technology service manager, how can you keep up with all the changes that are happening in the company as against all the changes that are happening outside with the hackers? I mean, it sounds like maddening. Do you sleep at night or what? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Good. Well, I, you know, as an organization, if your organization has good, good communication in, internally, which I feel we do, um, you know, you learn, okay, well, what's coming down the pipeline? What's the next project that we need to do? And then you apply the filters, like, okay, well, how does this affect our security? 
you know, what could happen here so that we can make sure we can avoid those pitfalls. And, and the other piece of that is getting educated. You know, I mentioned it's constantly changing. Yeah. And I love that. Yeah. Um, so there's several really good security-based conferences that happen here in Hawaii every year. Who, who runs them? Um, well, the ISSA is my favorite, mm -hmm. um, if I had to pick a favorite. And uh, they, it's a, a national security organization, and we have there's an Oahu chapter. Um, and their big yearly event is actually next uh, Wednesday and Thursday. They call oh, it the Discover Security well, Event. Yeah, I mean, what could be more appropriate? Because we are now in October, and every, everyone knows, everyone knows that October is National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. I think they may have planned it that way. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Sounds right. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, there's a few others that, that happen in town um, that are really good. And, you know, the vendors basically want to get people's business. And so, they, you know, they'll sponsor a lot of that, a lot of those um, events. So I go to those as much as I can because I want to learn what's new, what's going on, what's out there. Yeah. Um, so you have to work on two levels. So one is when you're, you're going to develop new systems in-house. Um, and you want to develop them in a way that you will be able to use, apply the rules and the techniques for avoiding hacking from outside. The other is you have to figure out how the, the hackers are changing mm -hmm. and uh, what they're doing. How do you find out? I suppose it's the same conference, but you have to have, you're looking at both things at the same time, what you do inside and what they're doing outside and how you can keep protected. You know? Well, you know, so we're really good at keeping the door closed, right, with the firewalls and not letting them in that way. So, yeah. so that's why I mentioned the key thing that you're trying to do now is train your staff yeah. so that we can prevent the, the back entry, the back door being unlocked. Is it the same kind of thing as you were talking about, you know, against phishing and social engineering where you're looking at an email and you're looking for suspicious telltale signs on the system and immediately, you, you know, you, you shut down that hole somehow and report it to you, for example, and you shut down the whole, is that, is, what kind of training happens inside? So, you know, part of the systems that we use are, are smart about um, what the websites are. So, you know, and we actually subscribe to a service that is, is global, that basically classifies websites. And then you say, okay, anything business related, you can go there. If it's been flagged as a malware site, it just gets blocked, even if you try to follow You do link. that in-house. Um, you're, well, you're, 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 our systems have that capability, and, and so we use it. Yeah. To, to lock it out. So if I'm a, an employee, Dietrich, I'm not going to be able to get access to that site because you put it on the no-go list. Correct. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes, you know, you get a legitimate site, and then, then the users will just let us know, and, and then we can check it out, make sure it's good, and then, and then add it to an exception list. So the training is to train them to be a little suspicious and see for the telltale signs and know what the telltale signs tell you and then, and then report it back to you. Well, well the training for the staff is, is um, you know, the two key factors to, to prevent people from, you know, either opening an attachment or going to a link. But mm -hmm. we also try to train them like, hey, this is what's going on right now. To give them kind of a thought process of like, oh, okay, well, people really are trying to knock on the door all the time yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and get in. And, and, you know, we just want to make people aware of that so that next time I get an email from, from uh, a suspicious or a suspicious looking email that they, you know, they think twice about clicking it. Yeah, I want to take a minute before, we have a break in a couple of minutes, but I want to take a minute to examine who is doing this, who's out there. You know, years ago when it first started, when Think Tech first started in the early 2000s, you know, we had, we had a bunch of kids on the show, and they would tell you about the fun, and one of them went to jail, by the way, about the fun and games, not because he was said on the show, but what he did before he came on sure, the show. Sure. <laughs> but, um, you know, these, these, there were kids, they were just fooling around. It was just a show you how smart I am kind of thing. That's not like that anymore. And it's not from local. And in fact, it's mainly, it's not even from this country, is it? Where is it coming from? Who's doing it? And how do they get the resources and access to do it? Well, you know, you mentioned the, the at one point it was just like, oh, look what I can do. I can break into this system and, and hack whoever. But then somebody figured out you can make money doing it. And you can make money anonymously. So like any other business or, or business concept, once people catch on, then it gets more and more diverse. So it went from you know, people doing little hacks here and there to, oh, well, I can write code. Hey, you can help me break into a website. Let's team up. And so now you know, those businesses have really diversified. It, it, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And so organized crime now is turning more to cybercrime because it's, so it's low risk and high profit. Yeah. 
So if I, if I break into uh, Equifax, for example, and I get hundreds of millions of um, you know, records with oh, yeah, email addresses and social security numbers and I don't know what else, um, how can I make money with that? I got to sell the list? Is that all it is, just selling the list? Where, where does the money come out? Well, yeah, so if you were the one that stole it, you'd want to sell it to make your money immediately and not have to do any of the extra work. Yeah. So you sell those credit cards or the social security numbers and addresses and things, and then people will want to buy them from you because then they'll go and they'll open up cards in people's names um, and basically just find ways of stealing that money using someone else's identity. Yeah, it's identity theft is what it amounts to. Correct. Yeah. What's interesting, though, is that undoubtedly these people are going to have to do it on the Internet. They're going to, they're going to you know, access a marketplace where you can buy and sell these stolen lists. And can't the government find them? Can't the government make, you know, put an agent in there somehow to impersonate someone who was buying or selling a list and then get enough information to go and arrest them? Can't, can't we stop them that way by stopping them at the buy and sell exchange point on the Internet? And they have. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, I know? No, no, they're, they're, <laughs> that's, it's called the dark web, you know, and, and the dark web, it, you can only get through through certain types of browsers, so Tor is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, yeah, the law enforcement agencies have busted places like that, like Pirate Bay is one of them. Um, the, the Danish officials just recently shut down another one of those websites because, like you said, they'll steal it, and then, you know, I was mentioning they'll, they'll want to sell it right away, and the people that do that in between yeah, then law enforcement has a way to try to track those folks down. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're mostly anonymous on the Internet. At some point, you know, you can be tracked down. Yeah. But um, if you're tracked, if they find out it's you and you live in the Ukraine, it's not likely that anybody can do much about that. Or for that matter, in Vladivostok, where, you know, they have plenty of cells of young fellows who uh, go, go out and hack just for, well, for the money. It used to be for the sport, now for the money. Um, so you can find out who it is. And you may be able to shut them down. You may be able to shut that dark web site down, too. But you can't go out and arrest them if you're beyond your reach to arrest. And, and you, you know, if you shut their site down, why do I feel so strongly that another one will pop up in 20 minutes? Am I right about that? Oh, it, it's a business gap, and someone will fill it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so as far as, you know, comp countries with extradition laws, you know, if they're friendly or not friendly, it's, I mean, people still do get arrested in those places, but then that country has to have a, a desire to want to have that person hacked or to, or to allow them to get um, arrested, right? If yeah. that particular hacker happens to be doing a whole lot of stuff for their country that they wanted to, then they may or may not want to yeah. let them get caught, right? Well, you know, it seems to me that we learned in this presidential, presidential election, and we haven't learned everything yet, it's still coming. Um, that, that hacking is ubiquitous around the world. Uh, it crosses boundaries. Um, there's really no limits on it. Um, and, uh, I mean, I just uh, I really wonder what can be done about that, because it's obviously it's expanding and unfolding different targets for different reasons. The political targets are really chilling, actually, where you can hack them, an election and the like. Uh, when we come back, though, Brian, uh, I'd like to talk about, uh, you know, what we can do as a business and, and as a person, and the, and the worst case analysis, if we don't do anything, Ooh, I'd like to talk about that too. Uh, that's Brian, Brian Fanning. He, he's the Fannin. He's the uh, technology services manager um, here on uh, National Cybersecurity Awareness Month at Dietrich Insurance right here in Honolulu. And we're examining these questions with him and um, learning what, what is being done, what can be done, what we can do. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. 
going to the game and it's gonna be great. Early arriving for a little tailgate. I usually drink but won't be drinking today cause I'm the designated driver and that's okay. It's nice to be the guy that keeps his friends in line, keeps them from drinking too much so we can have a great time. A little responsibility can go a long way cause it's all about having fun on game day. I'm the guy you wanna be. I'm the guy saving money. I'm the guy with the H2O and I'm the guy that says let's go. Master DNA. Bingo. You wish you were here for the break because we're talking about watches and chips in the back of your ear and all this. There's so much happening now. <laughs> <laughs> and Brian Fannin of Dietrich Insurance is fascinated with these kinds of things. So, you know, I mean, let's study, for example, what could happen with an insurance company in a worst case analysis. If somebody got in, you know, and just had, had their way, <laughs> what's the worst case analysis? Uh, does it have to be an insurance company? No, no, it doesn't. I mean, any company that deals with the public, any, it's a service company, right? It's a company that has your data and uh, where you need to have them, and they, you know, they are an important part of your business life or your personal business life anyway. So there's a few things. You know, there's regulations that, that you have to follow as a company. So insurance companies, for example, um, will handle work comp. And the folks that do do that will have HIPAA information, which is mm -hmm. personal medical information. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still a little unclear on what hackers can do with personal uh, medical, information. medical information. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what really they would care. And if they sell it, I don't, I don't know what that means. It doesn't mean anything to me. If they want to, well, I, I guess one thing they could use it for would be extortion, right? So maybe if you have something you're not you're ashamed that of. you don't want people to know of, yeah, yeah. or or um, well, or that it's none of their business to know, right? So right. Like you know, say I've got some bunion on my foot or whatever, and I don't want anybody to know. Yeah. Then or, or I may I, be willing. I may be willing to pay money to, to not have people know that. Right. So you can or, use it or, for extortion. Or a mental problem. Right? Yeah. That too. And, and I'm a political official, or you know, some kind of. I'm in an office where it wouldn't be too swift for people to know about my medical issues, my mental issues. Yeah. Sure. Um, so you know, another case would be um, some companies store credit card information, and then they've got to follow PCI rules. To make sure that that information is protected, um, you know, you've got name, address, sometimes social security number. Insurance companies have those as well, but a lot of companies in general can have that information as well. So, worst case, you know, all that information gets stolen, then all your customers. Let's just say you get a hundred percent success rate for the hackers, right? And they're able to hack everybody's information and, you know, steal their identity and buy new cars or or get cash or what have you. That's wrecking havoc, but it's also wrecking credibility. And oh, I'm saying, you know, if I, if I had a choice of uh, dealing with Equifax or not dealing with Equifax at this point, I'm not sure I do have a choice. But no. <laughs> I would not deal with them. I wouldn't want any. I wouldn't want that around me. They they somehow got my information, however they did that with fine print, whatever, uh, and then they they blow it by uh, allowing that um, that hacking. And if I had a choice of not having them. On my case, I would not have them. Well, and the bad thing is, is you know, even though companies will pay for credit monitoring, you know, that trust has been broken. Yeah. And, and trust is huge. Yeah. Especially when you're giving your personal information out. Yeah. You know, and, and some time back, you know, companies started selling your information to their, their affiliate partners so they could advertise to you and things like that. And yeah. That, that, that was such a shame because it, it was kind of the starting of people monetizing that stuff. Without really telling you. Yeah, well, they tell you in the fine print, but you know, yeah, nobody yeah, reads that yeah, stuff, right? Fine um, print, really. So, you know, worst case is all that stuff goes out, which is really bad for the customers. Now, if you're looking at it from a business standpoint, if you lose trust with your customer base, they're not going to want to work with you. Yeah. So, you know, if you're a. a well, insurance companies are all about trust. Well, absolutely. We make a contract to say, you know, we're going to restore you if, if uh, right. so something I, happens. I'm really relying on that going forward. In fact, it's life or death to my business, uh, or whatever risk we're talking about, uh, that, that I trust you to restore, as you said. So we have to make sure that doesn't, that, that the trust is justified and not broken. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's important. But it's also important for silly things like Facebook. <laughs> Where, you know, my information, I, they have a lot of information about me. I would say they have more information about me than you do, than Dietrich does. 
uh, or maybe even Equifax, because they're collecting everything I do, everything I say, everything anybody else says about me. Well, well they're collecting whatever you provide them, yes. Yeah. But it's free because you're the product. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's, it's troubling when, when you, you, you realize that people do not understand that what you provide to one of these social media companies is, is, is going to get out there beyond where you thought it might and, um, and be, not be sold or used against you in some way. But people don't realize, for example, people in judicial appointments where they're judges, it's not a great idea to go on Facebook and, and tell everybody what you had for lunch. Uh, you, don't want, you don't want your persona to be revealed in public or in private. You know? Well, if they know what you eat for lunch, then they know where you eat for lunch. And so if someone was targeting you, then they have some information that they could use for bad, right? Yeah, yeah. So we live in a world where all of this is transparent, and, and, we, and we buy into it because it, it has its positive benefits for us. But we can't, we can't, re we have to contain it. And that's really an art form. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm troubled because every time you look, you hear about hacks and breaches and whatnot. How can I know that a given company is taking the right steps? Wow. That's a really good question. Now, you know, one of the things that we do in the financial industry is that we vet our vendors. And the target breach was a great example of, of mm. how much did they vet their vendor. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and if you read about how that hack happened, it was very obscure if you really think about how it how wound its it way happen? in. Air conditioning, it was a, well, you know, I don't want to quote because I, I don't remember the exact detail of how, but it was a, a third-party vendor that had a vulnerability in their equipment. And the hackers took advantage of that. That got them on the network. And once they were on the network, then they were able to oh, work their way into everything is connected. Because everything is connected. So even the air conditioner is a part of the Internet of Things with an IP address and all that. Oh, yes. And you can get so. from one IP address to another IP address, uh, IP address, and then now we got you. So you said the Internet of Things is a magic word, right? So yeah, yeah. all the, those devices that we're putting into our houses and on our networks, all hackable. We yeah. could talk about that for a whole uh, yeah. episode, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, but as far as knowing, you know, when if comp companies are secure or if they're doing the right things, um, you know, the financial industry has to vet their who they're working with. They say, okay, are, you know, are you doing the things you need to do? Are you do you have a firewall? Do you have antivirus? Are you doing the baseline things that you have to get done? Because not a lot of companies do that, and it's surprising actually uh, yeah. to see how many just aren't on top of what you would consider the baseline security yeah. posture that you should yeah. have. I agree. And, and so you have three possibilities. One is they're not performing the baseline. Two is they're performing at the baseline. And three is they're performing beyond the baseline. So is there a way for me to find out in a given company where they are in those three possibilities? I mean, for example, if you came out and said, Jay, don't worry. We are above the baseline. Let me show you. And you can't show me too much because that opens an exposure to the hackers when you make a public statement about that. And so it's really, this is a conundrum. Because if you tell me everything about what you're doing, that's too much information. <laughs> well, and, and also if you say, hey, you know, you're the best, <laughs> then you're also putting a challenge out there. Right. right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you're tweaking somebody's pick. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so this is, so as it goes forward, every company needs a guy like you. Every company. I mean, I'm not talking about somebody who can go and program computers and help people get online and, you know, do all those things to educate people on the use of the systems and software in a given company. I'm talking about a guy who protects the company. Everybody needs you. Well, and, and the industry itself has got a huge um, gap in people that are skilled that can do this. I yeah. mean, organizations are getting, you know, chief information security officers and security folks, and it's just a, it's a huge, huge need. And, and um, you know, one of the organizations I'm affiliated with, you know, talks to the professors and said, look, what can we do to, to get the, the ramp up for people coming through school to, to get them interested in this and to, and to, to tell them that there's a huge need for this and there is going to be a huge need for it really going forward. Yeah. So, I mean, can I get a degree in protection as opposed to in creation of software? Can I get a, a PhD in that area? Um, or should I rely on experience? You know, one of the things, I mean, when we spoke before the show, you told me you, you had 15 years of experience in this area, and I was impressed with that. 
to me, that would be actually more important than somebody who just took a PhD, you know, last week, honestly. Um, so it, it sounds like there's a, there's a brand new career opportunity here, and there's not enough people who have, who have the experience, That's the degree or otherwise. Yeah. And there are, I don't know that there's a degree per se yet, um, but there are, um, oh, what do they call them? It's like, um, you know, vocational training courses and certifications that you can get there's a lot of certifications, but um, that you can get for security to to kind of add to your portfolio of being able to do security, right? So, like you mentioned, you know, if somebody just had a degree but didn't have the experience, um, you know, that could be in a lot of different fields where the experience helps to pay off. Um, but you know, I'm hoping that IT security in a as a whole will get some good mentors to really bring that next generation up. Um, and you know, train the next folks that are coming in. And, and I feel like there's a lot of good, um, some of the professors that I've seen talk here are doing a great job of that as far as you know, getting the educational piece there, but, but you know, having that mentor that's already doing it is, is a valuable thing, but yeah. we don't always get that opportunity. And it's a profession. I mean, it's, it's, it's just like any serious profession. You share with your other professionals, you learn from them, you schmooze with them, you go to conferences. We have. We have actually um, two guys here in our lineup. One is Andrew Lanning, and the other is Dave Stevens. Dave teaches at KCC uh, in this subject, and they're both into cyber terrorism and cyber attacks. So it's an important topic. I'm glad you're doing it. I'm glad we're covering it. And I would like you, you to come back so we can track with you on the latest and greatest, or the worst and, the worst and most awful, <laughs> as the case may be. <laughs> because I think our, our world which we, I think we were naive there for a few years at the beginning, say, when Bill Gates discovered the internet in 1995, we were really naive. And now, you know, we have to be much more sophisticated. There's no choice about it, yeah, yeah. So why don't you tell businesses, tell all the businesses out there, maybe one minute, actually, all right? All right. Tell them what the mindset should be, okay, in dealing with this issue in their company. So, you want to follow the baseline. So you, you want to you know, have a firewall, have antivirus. Think about how people can get into your systems and get things out. Um, you know, if you've got people that need to take confidential data off, uh, off site, then use one of these guys here. And this is a, an encrypted USB drive that you put a code into that unencrypts it and lets you access it. Um, and then you also want to think about what happens if you do get hacked. What are you going to do? You've got to figure out how they got in. You've got to figure out what they got. Um, you want to help your customers that did get their information stolen out there, um, whether it be offering them credit monitoring. Um, you'll need some sort of PR team. And part of that thinking about what's happening is look at cyber insurance. Um, mm. That's what cyber insurance is for, actually. Mm. Mm. It, it covers those things, because not everybody's going to keep a, what they call a red team on staff, someone that has the technical capability to go in and discover all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So when you have a cyber insurance policy, it covers that kind of stuff. Yeah, that sounds really important, in, in a, in especially in a ca case where your whole business is dependent on the, you know, the security of your equipment. Well, thank you, Brian. Great to talk to you. My pleasure. Brian Fannin, Dietrich, Technology Services Manager. Yes.